talk about retinal vascular disease. It's a two-part lecture. I think I come back maybe in January to finish it up. So, <laughs> um, but we're gonna. This is what we're gonna cover. It's retinal vascular disease, not including diabetes. So di the diabetic lectures are all separate. So today we'll get through venous occlusions and arterial occlusions, and then I'll come back, and it's kind of a medley of vascular problems that don't really fit into anywhere else of your lecture series. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag next time. So we'll start by talking about a central retinal vein occlusion. So um, the pathogenesis of a retinal vein occlusion is vascular endothelial damage that leads to compression of, a, of the retinal vein at the lamina cribosa. Anyways, everybody sh should know from anatomy where the lamina cribosa is at. So there's an occlusion just right in the, in the central retinal vein there. And then that leads to um, increased retinal capillary pressure, transudation of fluid, and subsequent macular edema. The clinical signs, um, really the classic clinical signs, are going to be four quadrants of hemorrhages, four quadrants of dilated tortuous vessels, and then optic nerve and macular edema. We break up a central retinal vein occlusion into the non-ischemic and the ischemic forms. Uh, the non-ischemic is going to be less severe with better vision, and they're going to have better vision outcome in the end. Almost half of these can resolve on their own. And the fluorescein is going to show prolongation of the retinal circulation time. There will be leakage from breakdown of capillary permeability, but there's really minimal non-perfusion, which is compared to the ischemic CRVO. They'll have worse vision to start with, worse vision to end with, um, more than 10 disc diameters of non-perfusion on the fluorescein angiogram. Often they'll have an afferent pupillary defect. Uh, and the vision loss will be due to ischemia, edema, and then neovascular complications. Uh, the ischemic CRVO has a really high rate of neovascular complications, and without treatment, 60% can get rubiosis. So this photo is just going to contrast the ischemic and the non-ischemic variation. So this is, you know, a fairly severe non-ischemic, actually, but you can see hemorrhages, tortuous vessels, dilated vessels, um, but compared to the ischemic form where it's really severe hemorrhages and optic nerve edema and significant macular edema, as well as a number of cotton wool spots present. Um, a hemiretinal vein occlusion is actually a variation of a central retinal vein occlusion. Um, and what happens in a hemiretinal vein occlusion, about 20% of us our superior and inferior draining retinal veins actually meet posterior to the lamina cribosa, and so there's an occlusion of one of those draining vessels posterior to the lamina cribosa. Um, so it actually has a really high rate of neovascular complications. Um, it's managed similarly to a central and a branched retinal vein occlusion. You would treat the, the uh, macular edema like a BRBO uh, with macular grid, anti-VEGF agents, and then the neovascular complications with panretinal photocoagulation. So the big risk factors for CRVO are age, hypertension, diabetes, glaucoma. In younger patients, you want to consider a hypercoagulable state and medications that could lead to the thrombosis. And then just moving on to, I'll just talk about the branch vein occlusion first, and then we'll cover the treatment studies together because they're pretty similar. Um, but a BRBO is a similar pathogenesis um, at that common adventitial sheath where the artery and the vein are coming together. There's thickening of the arterial wall, and then that compresses the underlying vein, leading to turbulent flow, endothelial damage, and thrombosis. If it's not if it doesn't start at an AV crossing site, you want to make sure you rule out an inflammatory or vasculitic type cause. Um, the biggest difference in the risk factors, and this is from the eye disease case control study, diabetes was not found to be an independent risk factor for a branch retinal vein occlusion, so sometimes that'll pop up on OCAPs. The other difference is an increased BMI at the age of 20 is an independent risk factor for a branch retinal vein occlusion. So those are really the two differences. This is a pretty 
typical clinical picture of a branched retinal vein occlusion. You can see the hemorrhages start in this <coughs> sector, right at this AV crossing site, there's cotton wool spots, and then downstream there's this tortuous vein, and then they can see macular edema on that picture as well. So, oh, this is just a just what I've mentioned before, the difference in the risk factors. So diabetes is a risk factor for a CRVO, and then the BMI and cardiovascular disease for a BRVO. So when they first come into your clinic, obviously you're gonna be checking the vision. Um, the vision has a big factor, uh, a prognostic factor in how they're gonna do ultimately looking for an afferent pupillary defect, measuring the pressure, looking for neovascularization of the iris, and then fluorescein, OCT. I think the fluorescein can be really helpful to differentiate from ocular ischemic syndrome or carotid disease, and also looking for inflammatory type causes of a vein occlusion. And obviously you wanna look at the amount of non-perfusion. And then in my clinic, you know, if they're coming in for the first time with a vein occlusion, I'll check, I'll have my technicians check the blood pressure in the clinic. Sometimes it's high enough, you end up having to send them to the ER. If it's, it's usually high, you know, if they're coming in with a vein occlusion, and so I'm usually trying to communicate with the primary care doctor, trying to get them into their primary care doctor for better management of their blood pressure. And then the other risk factor is glaucoma, so looking for cup to disc asymmetry or optic nerve cupping, and if they're not being treated for glaucoma, getting them in with our glaucoma colleagues to reduce the, the risks of that. If they really don't have any risk factors and they're under 50, then that's when we would do a hypercoagulable workup. And I think it's important to remember estrogen and oral contraceptives as a risk factor too in women. So this would be kind of your basic hypercoagulable workup that you would start, um, I don't know, you do it, then working with an, an onco a hematologist, oncologist to help with management and if they need um, anticoagulation based on any abnormalities on the hypercoagulable workup. So the causes um, acutely of vision loss from a retinal vein occlusion or edema and hemorrhage and, and capillary occlusion. Chronically, uh, patients can develop fibrosis, macular ischemia, they can develop epiretinal membranes, and then the other thing that you're watching for is neovascular glaucoma and complications related to that, and that's usually about three to four months after the initial event. Um, so this is an angiogram of one of my patients that I think demonstrates actually the complications of a branched retinal vein occlusion pretty well pretty florid neovascularization of the disc. You know, we've started some PRP here. There's still some capillary dropout here. I think that day we kind of tightened up the PRP. You can see collateralizations across the horizontal rafe here. Um, with a branched vein occlusion, you're more likely to get neovascularization of the disc or neovascularization, neovascularization elsewhere you don't really see rubiosis that often in a branch retinal vein occlusion. It's just not quite as ischemic. Uh, this is another angiogram showing that um, capillary dropout and then this collateralization that's occurring um, temporally here. Does anyone have a good way to kind of differentiate collateral blood vessels from neovascular blood vessels? Anyone have any, how, you, how we figure it out? Because sometimes the collateral, the collaterals can really look like neovascular fronds clinically and it can be hard to figure it out. The best way is actually to do an angiogram and collateral blood vessels aren't gonna leak and light up like you see, um, you know, this is obviously neovascular blood vessels are really hot and leak pretty vibrantly, but collaterals aren't gonna leak like that. The fluid's gonna stay within that blood vessel wall. So that's just another example of collateralization. And you really will see this in a chronic BRVO. So some people, you know, show up years later um, and you, you can tell that they've had an old BRVO even if they don't remember it based on this, this pattern here. The collateralization is actually pretty good because it just provides another outflow path and um, the edema can resolve and they can get better vision once that occurs. So 
now the studies, which are pretty popular to get tested on. I think the big studies to really remember are the BVOS, CVOS studies, which were really the first studies, really looking at natural history and laser treatment guidelines, and those were in the 80s. SCORE came out next, that's triamcinolone. And then I think you know, you'd be most likely to be tested on Bravo and Cruz, and it's important to remember that's ranibizumab, looking at a BRVO and a CRVO. Uh, so that's when we really led us down the anti-VEGF treatment path for, for vein occlusions. Um, obviously there's studies for a flibercept as well. And then bevacizumab we use really commonly, but there's no randomized prospective trials on bevacizumab for vein occlusions. So the questions from the BVS study, the first question was, is there a benefit to macular grid for macular edema secondary to a BRVO? And then their second protocol um, was to determine if there's a benefit for sectoral PRP in preventing neovascular complications. Um, so the results showed improved vision with laser treatment for macular edema. Eyes were treated three months after presentation. So they came in with their vein occlusion, they were watched for three months, and the reason they did that was to let the hemorrhages clear up a little bit. You don't want to do macular laser through fresh, fresh hemorrhages because it takes it up pretty hotly and leaves, leaves a fair amount of scarring. So treated eyes, 65% improved two lines versus 37% um, in untreated eyes. And the treated eyes were more likely to have vision better than 2040 at three years. And then the second um, outcome measure was looking at preventative PRP, and they found that there was no reason to do PRP until after neovascular complications developed. So you watch them, if they develop neovascularization, then you start the PRP. And the PRP is beneficial in reducing the risk of this vitreous hemorrhage. The CBOS study had really similar questions. Um, the first question was, is laser beneficial in preventing neovascular complications? And then the second question, does macular grid decrease vision loss from macular edema? And then they also followed the natural history of the CRBO. So, um, you know, I've seen this, um, question on my written boards um, and really there was no benefit visually from macular grid laser. It did improve the macular edema but there was no improvement in vision outcomes and so we don't do macular grid laser for central retinal vein occlusions based on this study. And early PRP failed to reduce the risk of ne neovascular complications and so we wait till neovascular complications develop and then we start PRP. There was a trend toward vis better vision, um, but there was no statistically significant improvement in older patients, particularly. So let's just summarize this. So for a BRVO from the BVOS study, we treat macular, macular edema with GRID. That was really our standard of care until the anti-VEGF trials came out. And then we treat neovascularization after it develops. CRVO treat neovascular complications after they develop, and there's no recommendation for macular grid for macular edema. So when I was a resident and fellow, we would have these horrible ischemic CRVOs, and we would just watch them. And then when the, it's crazy now, I was just thinking about it when I was looking at this lecture. Like I just remember doing PRP and these eyes with horrible, horrible hemorrhages, but there was nothing that we really could do for the macular edema and I think we see obviously we see a lot better outcomes now than we than we did before but that was the gold standard until these newer studies came out so um, obviously there's limits um, from laser we don't get awesome vision we do get a couple lines of improvement in vision but the average vision for a BRVO is 2040 2050 where today we see a fair amount of BRVOs that have 2025 2030 vision they're, they're doing a lot better now. And then CRVO had no improvement in vision, so we really didn't do anything. Um, so the CVOS study, I mentioned that it was also a natural history study. And so what they found is that the initial vision is the best predictor of outcome. If you come in with vision better than 2040, you're likely gonna keep good vision. Um, 
if it's worse than 2400 at presentation, you're probably going to keep bad vision. And then these middle range group, 2050 to 2200, a third will get better, a third will get worse, and a third will just stay the same. That's what the natural history. So the next study that came around was the SCORE study. SCORE was corticosteroids for retinal vein occlusion, and there was a SCORE for BRBO and a SCORE for CRBOs. The primary endpoint was the percentage that gained three lines or more. So they did a, there was a standard of care group, which for BRBO was macular grid, for CRBO was observation, and then there was one milligram and four milligram groups. So the score study for BRBO, there was really no difference at one year. And the steroid groups obviously required a fair amount of uh, treatment for elevated IOP, higher rate of cataract surgery, and so the three-year results actually found that laser treatment was better than steroids for a BRBO. And so after that study, macular grid kind of remained the standard of care. Um, the score for CRBO study, um, Obviously, these patients did a lot better. Um, it was one milligram versus four versus observation. The steroid groups did much better than observation with about a quarter gaining 15 letters. The observation groups, only 7% gained 15 letters. So the final recommendations for score for BRBO, keep doing macular grid. CR, well, obviously not anymore. I'm going to go to the anti-VEGF trials next. <laughs> but at that time, grid laser remained the standard of care. And then for CR CRBO, one milligram of IVT is better than observation. This, I think this study was published in 2009, which was, you know, that was, I mean, I'm not that old, but that was the year I finished my fellowship. So it's been a big change over 10 years. Then there was Ozerdex studies. I, I, Ozerdex is the sustained release um, dexamethasone implant, which lasts in the eye up to three months. And this was called the Geneva study. And patients did really well with the uh, dexamethasone implant, which you guys see us and we do at the VA all the time for this. Um, and then kind of really the big shift was when anti-VEGF agents, when their data was released. And anti-VEGFs are a key mediator in vascular permeability and angiogenesis. and so. Like I said, Bravo is the ranibizumab study, so remember that. <clears throat> they compared two different doses of ranibizumab, 0.3 milligrams and 0.5 milligrams to a sham injection. The ranibizumab groups did significantly better than sham with 50 to 60% of patients gaining 15 letters. Over half of the patients in the sham group required a rescue grid, while only 18 to 19% required grid rescue in the uh, treated groups. Cruz, ranibizumab for CRBO, and this was um, 40 to 46 to 47 percent gained 15 letters, while only 17 percent in the sham group gained, gained. And they gained pretty quickly, actually, and um, it was pretty remarkable. So, I think Bravo Cruz, I'm pretty sure that was published in about 2010, so it was a little bit after the SCORE study. And then this led to um, the anti-VEGF agents being our first line of treatment. I mean, obviously the downsides to the anti-VEGF agents is that we have to keep doing it. <laughs> and we're doing it over and over and over again. When, you know, I mean, I have patients that I've been doing their injections for five, six years. You know, I do it every 10 weeks and they do okay. We try and go 11 or 12, they get florid macular edema, they drop two lines and we shorten it back up. And you know, there's some evidence that maybe after a year and a half to two years, you might be able to get people off of their anti-VEGF agents, but there are some of these really ischemic vein occlusions that, I don't know, I think I'm just gonna be doing them forever. And so <laughs> I don't know, hopefully not, but right now I am. Um, if you, you know, if they, if you're able to get them off the injections, obviously you need to watch them for neovascular complications because those can still happen once you stop the anti-VEGF agents. And then a flibercept had their trials too. They're, they weren't quite as pivotal, but they led to their FDA approval, so we use them commonly. Um, the flibercept trials 
were Galileo and Copernicus, and then the vibrant study was the BRBO. But I think you'd more, li more likely see Bravo Cruz on a on a test than than these two. Obviously, but bevacizumab is really what we do first line for most patients, but that's based on uh, retrospectives, case series data. Um, there are, you know, some some people feel like. You know, you get a better response to flibercept than be bevacizumab, and so we'll often start people on bevacizumab, and then if we feel like we're not getting the response we like, then consider switching them over to to flibercept, and you can see a pretty dramatic response in some patients, and some patients it doesn't make a difference. Yeah, usually, yeah. You start with bevacizumab just because it's cheaper. Usually, it's cheaper. Yeah. Lots of insurance companies actually require um, proving that they fail bevacizumab um, before you can get them to pay for a flipper sub too. And a lot of people people do really well with bevacizumab. So, um, if you take someone off of anti-VEGF therapy because you feel like you know they've gone yeah. long enough, how how long do you follow them up for until you say like, all right, you're out of that range of neovascularization? Like they're like it's a really bad ischemic yeah. or or like a mild. You're talking about a bad one. Yeah, yeah. Like they've been on anti vegf for years, and then yeah. you're able to extend them out to a point where you feel comfortable. I still see it. Like if I I'll watch them monthly for at least six months, okay. and then I'll spread them out and go every two to three months, and then I'll see them at least twice a year okay. after that if it's been long enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, because really you want to monitor for neovascular glaucoma, neovascularization, elsewhere they could get vitreous hemorrhages or TRDs, but, you know, I do have some people that have done so poorly that we've stopped treating and, and they're, I just see them a couple of times a year and make sure that they're still doing okay. Yeah. But initially you'll see them every month off treatment. Um, I, I can't remember why I put this picture in here. <laughs> but it's a non-ischemic CRVO, um, fluorescein. Oh, I think maybe I was, so this, I think this demonstrates the delay in, a, in the retinal circulation time. So you can see we're at 33 seconds here, and we still haven't filled our retinal veins. We have laminar flow, but they should be completely filled at this point. Maybe, maybe that's why I did it. Um, and this, oh, this is actually one of my patients who came in with a really horrible, uh, ischemic CRBO. <clears throat> this, I don't know how to get good OCTs off access. I should have you guys show me. But anyways, this was his OCT, fluorid macular edema. I started bevacizumab, and then after three to four months, this was his OCT. It didn't touch it at all, and so then I switched him to a flibercept. And after a couple months of a flibercept, he dried up pretty nicely, and now he's stabilized with this OCT in 2060 vision. Um, and I, I, I think I've done a couple Ozerdex trying to get him a little bit further apart, but but he's doing pretty well compared to where he came in. You know, when they, before we had anti vegfs we wouldn't have gotten that much improvement really at all. Okay, so this is kind of what I do. I'll start with a monthly anti vegf and then I'll try and treat and extend them. I might try switching them to another anti-VEGF if I don't like the response, and then I'll add in steroids sometimes, trying to get a further interval. Um, I do do laser grid for uh, persistent macular edema in some of these patients when we're trying to get them off the injections, but I don't do, I really don't do kind of hot focal like we would do at the, I mean, not that any focal is really hot, hot, but I would have them go to mid valley and I would do a sub threshold micropulse laser and see if I can get um, a longer interval between injections um, instead of doing laser treatment here. There are milder vein occlusions that you can watch that can resolve on their own, both branched and mild uh, non ischemic CRVOs. And if they're pretty mild with good vision, uh, without macular edema, I could, I'll watch them monthly and they might resolve on their own. But if there's significant, um, any kind of vision impact, I would start treatment with anti-VEGF. Um, and then for treating neovascular complications, 
Um, depending on, on the severity of the neovascular glaucoma, often our glaucoma people like us to get an anti-VEGF injection in pretty quickly to try and save whatever is left of the angle. Um, often you'll have to do an AC tap at the same time to kind of bring the pressure down. The, there's a little risk of causing a hyphema when you do that, kind of that rapid decompression. Um, and then just getting PRP in, they'll often end up needing a tube so working with glaucoma to kind of get that stabilized. So this is kind of fun. There are some other treatments that people have tried. Um, people have done laser and surgically induced retinal venous anastomoses. And so what people will do is either with a really hot laser or an MVR blade in surgery, kind of just um, create an opening just right at the retinal vein crossing site and try and create this anastomosis. Uh, I've never done that, but I have done a radial optic neurotomy. When I was a fellow, we would do this, and you would do a vitrectomy, and you would go in with a 20-gauge MVR blade and basically just incise the optic nerve nasally down through the lamina curvosa, trying to kind of decompress this bottleneck, and uh, this is kind of the result. This is the resultant scar that you can see. And it's pretty wild to go in and just you know, <laughs> stick a blade through the optic nerve. <laughs> Obviously, we, you don't see us doing that anymore because we have anti um, But <laughs> We did do that when I was a fellow. And then I think this is pretty exciting. Just in the past year, one of the first uses of robotic surgery was done in Belgium where they basically cannulated a retinal vein occlusion. They used acroplasm using this robotic arm, kind of holding it in the retinal vein for several minutes to release the occlusion. So that could be pretty exciting down the road if that kind of takes off. <coughs> okay, arterial occlusive, how are we doing? Okay, artery occlusions. So we actually kind of did this a little bit in fluorescein pretty recently, so I think this should be pretty fresh in everybody's mind. Um, but a cotton wool spot is really a small uh, obstruction of a peripapillary capillary. This is a nerve fiber layer infarct. Uh, you'll see inner retinal ischemia, and often on OCT, you'll see edema in that inner retinal layer. It's often very superficial, uh, will fade over a couple months in most people, but in a diabetic, you, they'll persist for months, longer, even years. Um, really, this is never something that you should just say, oh, that's a cotton wool spot you know, that's gonna get better on its own. Like really, you've gotta find a cause for a cotton wool spot. It's not normal for somebody to come in with a cotton wool spot. Most commonly, it's gonna be diabetes, but you've gotta think of more unusual things um, if they don't have diabetes. Radiation retinopathy, sickle cell, HIV, uh, collagen vascular disease, leukemia. So there's your typical cotton wool spot. It's always interesting, you, you know, these end up in your clinic, people often, you know, they just kind of end up in your clinic. People don't know what they are. They don't know, you know, and it's usually cotton wool spot. They don't, you don't really see much on fluorescein angiogram usually. It's just kind of obscuration of the layers underneath. Um, so BREO, this is similar to the picture that CJ showed at fluorescein, but you get blockage of a retinal artery that causes retinal whiting and opacification of the retina over hours to days. Um, the causes, so the most um, frequent cause is going to be emboli, and cardiac and carotid are the most likely source. You obviously want to keep a uh, giant cell in your mind whenever these patients come in, and then after that, kind of the more rare things, but this is really where your, where your money is, is embolic phenomenon. So the sources are um, a cholesterol embolus, platelet fibrin embolus, or a calcific or cardiac embolus. Uh, there's been studies to see are we really good at uh, predicting the source um, based on what they look like, and the answer is no, we're really not. So you've got to do the full workup. You can't just look at it and say, oh yeah, that's from the heart. I mean, we can guess, but we're not that good at it. Um, rarely, these are kind of the outliers, uh, fat embolus, talc embolus, uh, CJ mentioned people getting like uh, procedures, fillers and things developing, uh, developing uh, emboli. So this is kind of the different appearances of platelet fibrin embolus kind of fills the vessel and it fragments and can move down the vessel. 
uh, the cholesterol in blood, so the hole in horse plaque, often you'll see it a bifurcation. It usually doesn't occlude blood flow, so it's pretty rare for that to cause a, an artery occlusion. And the calcific embolus, that's kind of that more chalky white, and usually that'll lodge at the optic nerve head and, and will cause an, an arterial occlusion. So here's another example of a hole in horse plaque. It's usually pretty small. Uh, the classic description is it's refractile, and that typically comes from carotid disease. Calcific, here's another example. Pretty chalky white, it's lodged. You can see how the flow is, you know, there's beating of that vessel downstream. And then another example of a platelet fibrin embolus. Um, central retinal artery occlusion, um, this is sudden, complete loss of vision. The retina is opaque and edematous. There's uh, the classic cherry red spot, and that's due to visualization of the choroidal vasculature through the fovea. Uh, the vision loss is usually permanent. Usually they're kind of count fingers, hand motion vision. Um, and if they're better than that, then they typically will have a patent ciliaretinal artery. For NLP or LP vision, that's usually more of a, a complete ophthalmic artery occlusion and not just a central retinal artery occlusion. There, I, there was one yesterday in triage I saw pictures of that uh, CJ was showing me. Um, usually, you know, these central retinal artery occlusions, they don't end up in the retina clinic right away. I think usually you guys are the ones, triage, the general ophthalmologist, the residents, you guys see them on weekends and kind of start the workup. So usually by the time they've gotten to me, that most of them have had the workup. Um, but they do end up in our clinic and it is important, like CJ talked about, really the most important thing in the central or branch retinal artery occlusion is you've got to figure out why this happened, prevent it happening to their brain, to their other eye. Um, so uh, the thrombosis is happening just right at the level of the laminar thrombosis. Sometimes you can see uh, a emboli present uh, at the optic nerve head, but often you won't see it. Uh, people can do B scans and see kind of a calcific embolus at the laminar thrombosis. I've seen Dr. Harry doing that. He likes to do that, <laughs> um, and which is cool. I think it's really cool. And then the biggest, you know, you want to keep giant cell in your mind, of course, when you're um, working these patients up. Uh, the lucky few that have a cilioretinal artery um, can get some preservation of vision. About a third of eyes have a ciliary retinal artery, where that ciliary retinal artery is coming from the posterior ciliary vessels instead of the central retinal artery. 15% uh, the ciliary retinal artery is supplying circulation to the macula, so those few will have um, have kind of a wedge of vision, and if they're lucky, it'll. This person had this kind of. This was actually a patient of mine that. Um, well, she has a wedge of vision. Unfortunately, it didn't get the phobia, so she doesn't have great vision, but she does have a quarter of vision she can look out of. And then this is a ciliaretinal artery occlusion. So for ciliaretinal artery occlusion, you really got to think of giant cell. That's the main cause of a ciliaretinal artery occlusion. So um, for you know the management, identifying the cause, reducing the risk factors. Uh, they do have a high risk, higher uh, increased risk of mortality after an arterial emboli. As far as ocular therapy. Um, there's a lot of things that have been tried. Um, I've had patients that have gotten to me quickly enough that I've tried to do an AC paracetesis or globe massage, you know. I've seen patients that have been sent for hyperbaric oxygen. It didn't really help. Um, but the biggest thing is that stroke workup that needs to happen. And so this was the policy um, that was mailed out a few years ago, and I'm sure you guys are really familiar with it, but from my understanding of the policy, unless it's changed, is that if they come in within seven days of an arterial occlusion, send them to an ER, or to our ER, and it goes to the stroke team, and they get admitted, and the whole stroke workup happens. If it's after seven days, then we're asked to kind of start the stroke workup. And so I've done it both ways, and I've started the stroke workup. I know it's supposed to be easy to get them into the neurologist quickly, and I kind of ran into some 
trouble with that and I kind of had to push my weight around a little bit to get the patient in but um, but it happened but it wasn't quite as smoothly as maybe Dr. Katz and Dr. Warner said it would be. <laughs> I think if you go through the resident rather than the stroke scheduler. Oh really? Yeah. Oh the neurology resident? Yeah. If you would, like call and say like it's been over seven days then yeah. more obligated. Yeah. Yeah. Well I, yeah. I mean it happened but yeah. I, it was a little more of a hassle than I wanted it to be. <laughs> But anyways, it works really well. I think the easiest is if they come in less than seven days and they go to the ER, then everything goes really smoothly. <laughs> but it's not always the case. Um, so kind of the stroke workup, MRI, brain, with the stroke protocol, echo, lipids, sideroids, CRP, A1C, um, aspirin, and a statin, and a carotid. Stroke, that's the stroke number, stroke schedule. So treatments, I mentioned the hyperbaric oxygen. I've seen people in town trying that. Um, you know, I know we talked about uh, uh, intraarterial TPA at FA the other day, and I know you guys mentioned maybe some people are still doing that a little bit. I haven't really seen that recently. That was a few years ago, right? Has anyone done it more recently? Uh, when I, last year when I was on primary call, I think I saw two patients get Oh, really? Uh, first IV TPA, which I don't understand, and then they're getting intra arterial TPA. Can they do okay? Uh, well, one of them's, I think, in your clinic, that um, young lady. Oh, that was pregnant with the. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she I mean, didn't help her. Yeah. It didn't, I think the other guy, it may have helped like a line or two, but it wasn't oh, okay. a significant change. I have seen reports of people, if there's an embolus just right at the optic nerve head, people try and yag that and try and like resume flow. Obviously there's a little bit of risk of bleeding, <laughs> but you don't have, <laughs> I mean, like, you have to think, you don't have much to lose, right? right? right. Cause like they're not, you know, so if they get in quickly enough, I've seen people try that. I've never done it myself. Um, so about 15% of eyes will get neovascularization of the iris. The retinal whitening will fade over a couple weeks and then you're left really with a pretty pale optic nerve and these really attenuated blood vessels and you'll have uh, pretty atrophic inner retinal layers on OCT. Um, ophthalmic artery occlusion, I have to say I've never, I don't think I've ever seen one of these to be honest, um, but their vision is reduced to light perception or no light perception. There's really no choroidal or retinal filling on floor scene. And then uh, the difference on ERG is that they have an absent A wave as well. There won't be a cherry red spot. And if you do um, autopsies of patients that have died with giant cells, 76% will have vasculitis of the ophthalmic artery. Other causes would be internal carotid dissection, mucor, or surgical interventions could lead to this. Have you guys seen any of these? No, I don't have them. Okay. Oh, did I? Oh, I finished. Okay. <laughs> I could have added in ocular ischemic syndrome. Okay. Um, questions? Yes? Have there been any studies that actually look at the efficacy of uh, treating uh, an artery occlusion versus just observing? Treating with, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's been, so there, it's hard to do like a randomized controlled clinical trial, right? And they don't come in. I mean, the hard thing about an arterial occlusion is any treatment has to be done within an hour to 90 minutes to preserve retinal function. Most patients present within a week or so. It's pretty rare for someone to get in that quickly. I think um, the one, a couple times I've had patients present that same day, and that's when I would try something like an AC paracetesis or you know IOP lowering measures, and the goal is to try and dislodge the clot. Um, but there's, I think it's a pretty hard thing to study and the timing is so critical and any kind of reports are all just small case series that people report like for the YAG laser or the hyperbaric oxygen, all those are just things people try but I think it's a pretty hard thing to study. Do you, you know? have any anecdotal uh, cases where you've done something and there's actually a true equation versus just well, it's hard to know, right, because it's like, well, maybe they would have gotten a little bit better on their own, but I did have, I did do an AC tap, and then that patient actually, that was for a CREO, and that patient actually had some recovery of vision, um, and that's, but that's pretty, 
rare, and that pay, that might have been like more of a milder form of a CR, CRAO that they might have gotten a little bit better anyways, because it was pretty mild when I saw them. That's, I mean, usually they don't get to me that quickly, you know? I think usually they're at the general ophthalmologist and then they get to retina within a week or so. Yeah, I think, it's not like their face is drooping, so they don't know. Yeah, because the people, I don't know, I always, because like I think if I like lost my vision, yeah. I'd probably freak out, yeah. you know? The creepier the ER, like. <laughs> Right, but then I, you talk to like lay people, like I'll talk to my husband about that, like how did this person just sit around with a retinal detachment and show up Friday afternoon? And he's like, well you just think, oh it's going to get better, it's going to get better, and you're hoping in your mind it's going to get better, but then it doesn't actually get better, and so all of a sudden you're like, I better get this seen by Friday, because I don't want to be like this over the weekend. Like I think some people just, you know, there's a little bit of n denial, and you think maybe to get better. So I think, you know, I don't know, I guess there's been so much education regarding strokes. Maybe it would require more kind of education regarding uh, vision loss as a sign of stroke and more prompt uh, evaluation. And especially like even if they go to the ER, they're kind of triaged down the list, right? Like, you know, you come in with vision loss to the ER, it's not like you're the first one to be seen. Like, if you come in with stroke symptoms, they bump you up pretty quickly. But vision loss, I don't think they get a lot of the priority. Depends, I think, on who triage is it. Because some of them I've seen get through very, very quickly. Oh, really? Um, those were the two that got IATPA. I mean, one of them got metaflated in from Moab. Um, so it really depends, I think, on who the who? physician triaging the call. Um, oh, interesting. who hears the complaint and says, oh, yeah, that doesn't sound normal. That needs to be seen pretty emergently. Yeah, yeah. But then you have the other ER attending that says, uh, you know, there's a couple of people with stab wounds, you know, they need to be seen more emergently, so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it would be, I mean, I think intraarterial TPA could be successful, but it's risky, right? You know, that yeah. procedure is really risky. Um, but I think that could be successful if people could get in quickly enough and triage quickly enough and then get get to the radiation suite quickly enough for the treatment to happen. But, you know, 90 minutes is a really short window before the retina is pretty much gone, you know. How, what does a combined CRAO, CRDO look like? Like, how can you? How can you tell? So you'll see, um, it looks, you know, it's pretty rare to get both. Um, and I've seen reports of I actually was just reading a report last night of a combined CRAO, CRBO that happened after um, intravitreal injections. I think just with the, the idea of this rise in the IOP causing this combined CRAO, CRBO. And so you'll have delayed filling on the um, fluorescein angiogram, and then you'll also have a delayed circulation time. Often you'll acutely see a cherry red spot, but it will be associated with vascular tortuosity and retinal hemorrhages. And then the layers of, all layers will be pretty ischemic on an OCT down the road. And that's more of a sequential 